very much for joining us today. I really do hope that you'll be able to get a lot out of this session. Um, I'm your host from SRUK, Annabelle, and I am joined by the fantastic Dr. Elizabeth Franzoni today. Um, so Dr. Elizabeth Franzoni is going to give us a presentation that lasts about approximately half an hour, and then we will be having a Q&A session. So please feel free to type in your questions um, that you may have at any point during the presentation. However, we will wait until the end to go through them. Um, as, as a side, please also try to make sure that your questions are not too personalized so that everyone can benefit from everything. Okay, so if that all sounds good, I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Elizabeth Franzoni. Um, so she is a consultant physician in the interstitial lung disease unit at the Royal Brompton Hospital. She looks after patients with scleroderma and has worked with Royal Free on this. She is a member of the British Thoracic Society of the European Respiratory Society of the Pan London Interstitial Lung Disease Network and is an honorary faculty member of the PhD program in cellular biology and psychopathology at the University of Siena, Italy. So Dr. Elizabeth Rinzoni, please, would you be able to take it away? Thank you very much, Annabelle, for that uh, kind introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to be here this morning and to speak about, I'm gonna try and share my screen and hopefully it'll work. Um, and okay. let's go from the beginning slideshow. Can, can everyone see this? I yeah? can see it. Good, good. So basically, um, I'll be talking about systemic sclerosis or scleroderma associated IOD. So in interstitial lung diseases overall, the interstitium, so the area that separates the red blood cells from the air sac, um, is thickened by a mixture of inflammation and scar tissue, as we can see here on the right, such that exchange of oxygen going into the red blood cells and carbon dioxide being moved out of the blood cells into the air sac um, is made more difficult. Um, interstitial lung disease is frequent in scleroderma, but in many patients, it is only limited and will not progress. So as you can see here with these two examples, on the left, we have an essentially normal lung of a patient with scleroderma. On the right, we have a patient with extensive disease. This is a CT, high resolution CT section. And you can see that compared to the left, the lungs are whiter, they're grayer rather than blackish. So this white is called ground glass. And you can see that the airways are more visible. So here they are some examples. So they're more dilated, they're a bit wrinkly, and this is what is called traction bronchiectasis because it's believed that the surrounding scarring pulls the airways apart, which then become more visible. Uh, there are certain uh, risks um, that certain parameters that increase the risk of developing interstitial lung disease, including older age and male gender, certain types of autoantibodies. So we know, for example, that anti-topoisomerase antibodies or SCL70 antibodies are associated with a high likelihood of developing ILD, whereas patients with anti-centromere antibodies are unlikely to develop extensive ILD. It's the first years from the diagnosis uh, which are the most at risk for developing ILD, and then the extent of skin disease. So if a patient has diffuse skin disease, so scleroderma above skin thickening, above the elbows and knees, uh, they are more likely to develop ILD. The symptoms, at least initially, can be quite subtle and the patient may be asymptomatic, which is why it's important that every patient with scleroderma at diagnosis has full lung function tests and a chest high resolution CT. Cough is quite common. It can also be caused by uh, reflux, uh, so heartburn, indigestion, gastroesophageal reflux symptoms can cause or worsen the cough. Um, breathlessness, at least with limited disease, is only present with more strenuous exertion, such as climbing several flights of stairs or walking uphill. If the lung fibrosis is more extensive, then breathlessness can also occur on walking 
on the flat or during daily activities such as getting dressed or having a shower. But of course, it's important to consider that breathlessness can also have a number of other causes, including issues with the muscles, the joints, heart disease, uh, loss of fitness, weight gain, etc. <clears throat> So all patients uh, will at baseline will also have full lung function tests. They allow the evaluation of the different compartments of the lungs. Um, and the two parameters that we look at the most are forced vital capacity or FVC, which is the total amount of air, number of liters that a patient can expel during an expiratory maneuver, and the diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide or DOCO. We also perform lung function tests on follow-up to assess response to treatment, to monitor if the patient is not being treated, but just to have evidence of stability. And the frequency will depend on the extent of the ILD and the risk of progression in the individual patient. And you can see here there is a, um, an address on the BLF website that explains more about lung function tests. So when we're looking at lung function tests over time, um, the parameter we look at the most is forced vital capacity because it's the variable that most reflects IOD changes over time. It has been used as the primary outcome in all of the recent scleroderma IOD trials. Uh, DLCO also reflects IOD and it's a very sensitive marker, but it's not specific because it can also reflect involvement of the lung vessels. And so an isolated drop in gas transfer with the, a stable force vital capacity, stable CT changes could make one think of the development of vascular disease, de development of pulmonary hypertension, and we would then perform screening tests for pulmonary hypertension that include an echocardiogram, serum BMP levels, and a six-minute walk test showing marked drops in oxygen. <clears throat> Here we've got a CT scanner, uh, and as I said, all patients at baseline should get an HRCT. A high-resolution CT captures the images with a greater detail than a normal CT, and it's therefore useful to look at the interstitium. And as we can see, we can have very limited disease. So in this patient, pretty much normal lungs, except for some mild reticulation here at the periphery at the basis. So this is definitely limited ILD, as opposed to extensive ILD in this patient. As the slices go lower into the lungs, you can see again this ground glass. So the gray, white areas um, in, in most of the lungs at the basis, and also, again, the traction bronchiectasis. So you shouldn't be able to see airways, these blacker bits, so well, and you're seeing them so well because they're dilated because of the surrounding fibrosis. So again, these are called traction bronchiectasis, and this patient has extensive IOD. So predictors of worsening are extensive disease or severe lung function impairment. Again, some factors that predict development of IOD can also predict the more, greater likelihood of worsening, including antitopoisomerase, early disease, diffuse skin disease, short-term lung function. So if we have lung function over time that is showing progression, uh, we know that that patient is more likely to continue to progress unless treatment is instituted. And there is some evidence, although not conclusive, that microaspiration of stomach contents into the lungs could also cause worsening. We know that the course of lung function in patients with scleroderma is highly variable. So there are some patients that whose FVC, here it is, the force vital capacity, stays stable over time some for which it improves, others that have variable rates of decline, and about 9% of patients have a very rapid decline. So when disease is severe, it's usually straightforward uh, to decide to start treatment because we know that these are patients that are going to 
be progressive, most likely. It can be more difficult to decide on treatment in those that have very limited disease with very mild disease. And in these patients, behavior over time is important with lung function symptoms, CT. And we're also learning more about other factors. We are also learning a lot from clinical trials. And um, it, it has been fortunate that over the last 15 years, there have been a number of trials specifically dedicated to IOD in the context of systemic cirrhosis. So the first randomized placebo-controlled trial was performed and published in 2006 and compared cyclophosphamide here in the white uh, circles Again, on the y-axis, you have the forced vital capacity, which was the primary outcome. So patients were treated for a year with cyclophosphamide in the white circles or placebo, and then followed up for a further year. And what was seen was that the forced vital capacity improved, and there was a significant difference compared to placebo, and improved the most six months after having stopped the cyclophosphamide. But then that improvement was completely lost after another six months. And this suggests that you need ongoing immunosuppression to maintain the improvement. But cyclophosphamide long-term has very high risks of development of cancer, for example, and is more toxic than other immunosuppression. So the SLS2 trial was designed to compare mycophenolate against oral cyclophosphamide. Both drugs were associated over two years with an improvement in the forced vital capacity from baseline a small but significant improvement. They were also associated with an improvement in breathlessness and in skin scores, but mycophenolate was better tolerated. There were less side effects with reductions in certain types of blood cells and fewer patients had to stop prematurely. And then we have the FOCUS trial, uh, which was another randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of tocilizumab, an anti-IL-6 drug. And IL-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which is believed to play a key role in patients with scleroderma. In this trial, actually, the primary endpoint was the change in skin scores, so change in scleroderma skin disease. But a key secondary endpoint was the change from baseline in forced vital capacity. Now, it's important to note that these patients were highly selected. So they were patients that had early disease, less than 60 months from the diagnosis of scleroderma. They all had to have diffuse skin disease, which we know is associated with more rapidly progressive IOD, and they had to have at least one marker of inflammation, so increased CRP or ESR or platelet counts. And what this study found was that actually the primary outcome of the skin disease was not met, but the, the secondary outcome of change in FVC was uh, met both in all patients and in the patients at about two thirds of patients that had IOD. And there was quite a marked difference. So patients treated with tocilizumab in the red line uh, maintained stability of the forced vital capacity, whereas patients that had, were on no treatment actually lost quite a bit of forced vital capacity. And if one looks at the milliliters lost in that year of the trial, uh, patients on placebo lost 257 milliliters, that's a quarter of a liter, and the patients on tocilizumab only lost 20, so a marked difference, suggesting tocilizumab can prevent progression in this selected group of patients at high risk of progression of IOD. And then finally, we have this census trial uh, that looked at the effects of nintadenib in systemic sclerosis associated IOD. These were patients that were quite different from the focus trial patients. They had to have um, extensive fibrotic changes on CT, so at least 10% extent of changes. Um, seven years since the first diagnosis of scleroderma and background immunosuppression was allowed. And what the trial found was that uh, patients on nintadenib 
lost less of the lung function of the FVC than patients on placebo. Even the patients on Intadlib did decline slightly, so on average lost about 40 mils, but the patients on placebo lost more. Nintadlib had no effect on breathlessness or quality of life, and diarrhea is a significant side effect of the drug, and there was no benefit on extrapulmonary features such as skin disease. And then more recently, we've just had heard at the ERS conference uh, the results of the recital trial presented by Toby Maher, uh, who was the um, PI for this study. Uh, this was comparing brituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody. So that means it eliminates B cells, which are a key type of white blood cell, um, from the circulation from 6 to 12 months. And this was compared to IV cyclophosphamide. And it was um, for patients with a variety of connective tissue disease, IOD, but these included uh, systemic sclerosis patients. So 51 patients were randomized to rituximab, 50 to cyclo, and other patients, about a little more than a third had uh, scleroderma. The primary outcome was the change in FVC at six months, but it was also then looked at at one year. The trial has now been completed. The results have been presented both at the ATS and ERS conferences. And I think that next week it'll be published online in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. The primary outcome, as we said, was a change in FVC over 24 weeks, and um, there was no difference between rituximab in blue and cyclophosphamide, but both drugs were associated with an improvement compared to baseline, and that improvement was maintained at one year, at 48 weeks. So from what we've said, we've seen that standard immunosuppression at the moment is usually mycophenolate as the, um, the drug that is associated with the least side effects um, compared to cyclophosphamide, for example, and helpful in many cases of scleroderma IOD. In selected cases, however, other drugs can be considered, including IV cyclophosphamide. Tocilizumab has the anti-IO6 drug has actually been approved by the FDA in the US uh, for the treatment of scleroderma ILD. It has not yet been approved in Europe and in the UK um, for this, but one would think um, about its use, particularly in selected subgroups with high likelihood of progression. Other treatments such as rituximab, as we've seen, have shown promise and do offer some advantages to IV cyclophosphamide. Uh, and then for patients with significant fibrosis, the antifibrotic agent nintadinib has been shown to slow down the progression of disease. We do need trials now on the effects of combination of different treatments. These drugs that we've seen are effective in uh, scleroderma ILD, all act on different mechanisms of the disease. So we need to know more about what is the effect of different combinations of treatment. And for example, the SLS3 trial is currently ongoing and I think actually should be completed um, now, and we should hear about the results shortly, uh, and evaluating the combination of mycophenolate and profenadone against mycophenolate alone. So we'll know more about that um, uh, and whether there is an additive effect, but we need to also learn more about other combinations. And so what we have now is in a patient with mild limited IOD, we would decide whether that patient is at low risk of progression, in which case we would monitor. If they have early mild IOD, but there are certain features that suggest high likelihood of progression, one would consider tocilizumab. As I've said, it's not, li it's not licensed in the UK, but um, is in the US. Um, and then as the disease progresses, um, if the disease progresses, one would consider immunomodulation, for example, with mycophenolate. Uh, 
what we don't know is when should we be introducing uh, antifibrotics, in which patients, in which patients should we be thinking about early combination of immunosuppressants, and if the disease progresses on immunomodulation, you would consider adding in an antifibrotic treatment. Uh, and then in the non-pharmacological approach, uh, greater importance is being given to exercise, for example, and there's this working group looking at the importance of exercise um, to improve both certain musculoskeletal aspects, but also uh, respiratory symptoms. And so exercise and physical activity as a non-pharmacological intervention that can help and then in patients that um, drop their oxygen during activity, supplemental oxygen can also help and improve quality of life. And we performed a study uh, looking at six weeks, sorry, two weeks of oxygen compared to no oxygen. And then patients would cross over to, if they were on oxygen, no oxygen, if they were on no oxygen, to oxygen for another two weeks. And at the end of each two weeks, we would check with a number of questionnaires how patients were feeling. And Patients were included if they had normal oxygen saturation at rest, that's an oximetry of uh, at least 94%, but if their oxygen saturation dropped to less than 89% on a six-minute walk test done normally down a quarter. And the study showed that quality of life related to respiratory symptoms was improved by oxygen. And in particular, that breathlessness was better in the majority of patients compared when they were on oxygen in the two weeks on oxygen compared to the two weeks that they were not using oxygen. Finally, in patients with extremely extensive and progressive IOD, there is the option in selected patients uh, for lung transplant. Um, this is the largest observational cohort study looking at the impact of lung transplant on 90 patients with scleroderma uh, over uh, a period in 14 European transplant centers. Uh, they observed that survival rates in scleroderma were similar to lung transplant survival rates with other types of diseases. So 81% of patients had survived after one year, 61% after five years. The risk of death seemed to be higher in female patients with pulmonary hypertension compared to males without pulmonary hypertension. And so the study suggests that scleroderma per se should not be considered as a contraindication to lung transplant. However, often the involvement of the gullet, so esophageal involvement, is often a barrier to lung transplant in patients with scleroderma. So in conclusion, we've seen that there have been really a number of uh, clinical trials that offer real hope for patients with scleroderma IOD. Now that we have a number of drugs for um, our patients, we also need trials specifically looking at combinations of treatment. And one of the challenges for the futures is now that we have a number of choices, is how do we customize uh, the treatment in the individual scleroderma patients so as to optimize benefits while minimizing side effects, of course, in concert with the patient wishes. Um, and there is increased evidence that self-management strategies such as regular exercise uh, can improve the quality of life and symptom benefits. And with that, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. So now we will be taking any questions. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any, please feel free to just put them into the Q&A um, link at the bottom of the page. Um, I see that we do have some already. Um, let me just see here. Um, okay, so Sally asks if you have any suggestions on how you could slow down or possibly prevent this from happening. So, um, so two uh, 
I think the, the only trial that has uh, looked at basically prevention of worsening is the FOCUS trial, uh, the one looking at uh, anti-IO6. Um, and although the trial was not focused on IOD, so there are some that say we should have further trials before we can have a definitive uh, recommendation on tocilizumab. However, in certain patients where, as I said, for example, in the trial, uh, patients had to have diffuse skin disease, early disease. So on average, these were patients that had only two years from the diagnosis of scleroderma, and they also had raised inflammatory blood markers like raised CRP, raised DSR. So in these patients, it would seem that early treatment can prevent the worsening of fibrosis. And so we're learning, uh, we're not able to use tocilizumab yet in Europe or the UK outside of a clinical trial, uh, but we are learning more about which patients one needs to uh, target to prevent progression. Then to slow down disease progression or to halt it, then we've seen we've got a number of drugs. One is mycophenolate. And actually there is now a trial going on uh, led by Chris Denton at the Royal Free, looking at mycophenolate also much earlier in the disease and seeing if that can also be used to prevent the progression of lung fibrosis. Um, and interstitial lung disease. And then if you have, if you're already on immunosuppression, but still progressing, and the physician that is treating you believes that, you know, you've had enough, you can't increase the immunosuppression, we do now have the option of introducing an antifibrotic agent, Nintadnib, which in the UK is licensed for patients who are declining despite optimal management of their condition. So I don't know if this, I hope this answers <laughs> at least part of the question. I'm sure it does. It was interesting either way. Um, so Sue asks about the link between um, cylindrical bronchitis and systemic scleroderma and how they differ and relate to each other. Do you know about that? So, it, so there is a difference between traction bronchiectasis, which happen in a lot of patients with scleroderma IOD because they just suggest fibrosis. So like I showed on this CT, when you have uh, the airways being surrounded by scar tissue, they tend to be pulled apart and therefore dilate because bronchiectasis just means dilated airway. So there's the traction bronchiectasis where the airways are dilated by the surrounding fibrosis. And then there's the freestanding bronchiectasis, which I imagine is what Sue is referring to, because when you talk about cylindrical bronchiectasis, you usually talk about freestanding. So these are bronchiectasis that are there independently of the scar uh, tissue. We don't normally see them in scleroderma. Uh, we tend to see them more in other types of connective tissue disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or Sjögren. Um, but, you know, one can have an overlap. So I imagine that it could be that Sue has cylindrical bronchiectasis because she has an overlap connective tissue disease, or she has another reason for freestanding bronchiectasis, such as recurrent infections in childhood, or another another cause, um, and and so I hope that is clear clearer how they relate to the IOD. So basically, you have two types of bronchiectasis. The type that relates to IOD in scleroderma is traction bronchiectasis, um, with the fibrosis pulling apart the airways. Then you also have freestanding bronchiectasis that are not related to the fibrosis itself but can occur in connective tissue diseases, not usually in scleroderma. I see. Thanks. So um, Melanie asks about, um, so she's on mycophenolate and has also tried the um, psycho Phosphamide. Psychophosphamide, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering what other treatment options there were available. Yeah, uh, so of course, without knowing the specifics of the situation, it's very difficult to, to say. 
Um, however, as I've said, if uh, um, the consultant feels that there isn't space for more immunosuppression because of the risk of the finger ulcers getting infected, I imagine is the, the problem. Um, and there is a demonstration that her lung disease is progressing despite mycophenolate, then there would be the option of starting nintadenib. Now, at the moment, nintadenib in the UK can be started in any patient with progressive fibrosis, not only scleroderma, any progressive fibrosis, as long as it's been demonstrated that they have progressed despite optimal treatment. And progression has to be demonstrated with lung function, uh, and symptoms or CT and symptoms. So you need to demonstrate progression. Symptoms alone would not be enough, but if there is a worsening on lung function or on CT, that would be enough to start nintadenib. Nintadenib, as we've seen, is an antifibrotic agent. It slows down the rate of progression. It does have a number of side effects, the main one being diarrhea, and unfortunately, it does not make feel, patients feel better. So we always discuss this with patients because um, otherwise one gets disappointed that you've started a drug and actually you're not feeling better, but it does slow down the rate of progression. Um, so that would be an option to be discussed with the, with the treating physician. So Julie asked a similar question on how many times can psycho, uh, psychophostamide be used in a lifetime? So normally we use cyclophosphamide. So in the UK, we've tended to use cyclophosphamide intravenously rather than orally, as has been used in the States. And there are several advantages to that. One is that because we give 600 milligrams per square meter, so that's about in a normal weight height person, about 1.2, 1.3 grams um, each time. So if you're giving six months, you're giving around eight, nine grams. Whereas if you're giving it orally at 150 um, each day, you're going to rack up a lot more cyclophosphamide each month. So if one has had only six courses of IV cyclophosphamide, I wouldn't have that much of a problem in repeating that. So if that has been effective and that is an option that is believed to be uh, beneficial, one could repeat it for another six months. Um, the problem with repeating it, and nobody has an exact length of time, but the, the more the duration of the cyclophosphamide, the greater the likelihood of developing cancer down the line. But I would say that 12 months or six months and then repeat it another time after six months is still less than a whole year of oral cyclophosphamide as was used in the SLS1 and SLS2 trials. Thanks, that's quite interesting. Um, so Abby wanted to know, in this instance, what would regular exercise be classified as? I get breathlessness, I get breathless hoovering, mm -hmm. and I'm worried about doing too much. Yeah, very good question from, uh, from Abby as well. I mean, all the questions are really good. Um, and so regular exercise is personalized. And I think if one gets breathless hoovering, which a lot of patients report, so hoovering, I hadn't realized until hearing, you know, patients talking about hoovering, how tiring and uh, hoovering is. And another activity that makes patients really breathless is making a bed, because I guess the just the movement of moving the sheets around and walking around the bed is really tiring. Another one is having a shower. Um, now, if all of these activities um, make you quite breathless, I would suggest it would be good to have a six minute walk test or even to check. I mean, the only problem with scleroderma is you can't have Raynaud's, so the oximeter may not be such a great uh, reader. But if you get a reading from an oximeter, one could try buying one over the internet um, and seeing what happens to the oxygen when hoovering, for example, or when climbing flights of stairs, um, when uh, climbing uphill. And if, it, if it's going consistently below 90, 89%, then discussing with your 
treating physician as to whether you should have a formal six minute walk test, check whether uh, oxygen drops to less than 89%. And if it does, it might be that ambulatory oxygen just for certain activities. So patients are really worried when they hear about ambulatory oxygen because one of the immediate reactions is that means that uh, you know it's the end of the line, there's no other options. And instead, ambulatory oxygen can be used for the more strenuous exertion. And maybe just to go down to the shops or have a walk, it's not. But if you want to exercise more and you notice that your oxygen is dropping to less than 89%, that might be the time to use it. The other thing that is really important I didn't have time to do is pulmonary rehabilitation. So let's say you're more breathless, but your oxygen doesn't drop. It might be that you would benefit, and indeed all patients benefit when they have lung fibrosis from pulmonary rehabilitation. So that is a series of um, uh, exercises done formally for 12 weeks usually. It is two or three times a week. The problem with that is often there's a long queue to get into the pulmonary rehabilitation uh, sessions. During the pandemic, a lot of them were not available because of the pandemic and risk of um, contracting the virus. And several services are now offering video linked pulmonary rehabilitation session. Um, aside from all of that, uh, regular exercise will be whatever works for the individual patient. So if I like walking and going in the park and walking, just doing that on a regular basis and maybe trying to do a bit more every week or every month. Um, some people like uh, bicycling. It might be that you would rather have a, an exercise bike at home and do it uh, more regularly. So it can be very individual. Thanks. Um, so Sabine asked, you mentioned that one of the trials showed improvement of FBC, but there was no improvement of quality of life. So how would this trial be used in the future? So the ones I think that I mentioned that improved FBC actually did improve quality of life. So um, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, um, the 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 one that doesn't improve quality of life is nintadinib, so the antifibrotic treatment. And so that then goes back to my previous answer. So basically, you would use nintadinib at the moment only if there is progression of disease despite standard treatment, for example, mycophenolate. And a patient is on mycophenolate, their lung function is getting worse uh, despite mycophenolate. The treating physician doesn't think that increasing immunosuppression is an option. That's where you would use nintadinib. Hmm. Oh, I see. Um, so Melanie asked if there's been any connection with COVID in stimulating the progress of ILD. Sorry, in stimulating, in the sense, can, uh, yeah, can COVID uh, worsen ILD? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, in, in, in some patients, uh, not many, uh, but we have seen uh, post-COVID worsening of the lung fibrosis. Thankfully, with the vaccines, with Omicron, we have also, so the vaccines protecting against severe disease, Omicron being itself a milder form of the virus, it seems. Um, we have seen quite a few patients that have got over COVID well with only mild disease and no permanent change in lung function. But there have been a few patients uh, across the IOD board that have worsened post-COVID. Mm. Um, thanks. So what symptom changes should you look out for in the instance of, say, if you get a worsened cough, should you just wait until your next appointment to report that to your doctor? Is it something that you feel you should um, actively go get tested for? So I think because cough can have a number of causes, as I mentioned, you can have cough because of reflux and heartburn, which sometimes can be silent, um, or post-nasal drip. So cough can have a number of causes, doesn't necessarily mean that your lung fibrosis is getting worse. I would look at breathlessness 
So, you know, and, and basically breathlessness on exertion. So are you still able to do as much as you were able to do six months before? So long uh, walk the same amount of time on the flat, or if you were previously able to do a flight of stairs without stopping, do you now need to stop midway on the flight of stairs? Or if you previously could make the bed without without undue problems, are you now having to stop because of breathlessness rather than cough? And so I would be looking at the breathlessness. Um, yes, I think that would be, I, I mean, of course, the cough can also be a, a, a cause for concern of worsening, but the breathlessness is more a, an alarm bell that things are not going and would be worth contacting the treating team. Yeah. Um, so Edith wants to know about the best form of exercise to improve lung function, or is just all exercise good exercise in this regards? So exercise doesn't actually improve lung function. So lung function will stay the same. What improves is your body and your muscle ability to use oxygen. So your muscles become much more efficient with exercise. Um, and there isn't, I think the best exercise is probably a combination of aerobic exercise. So whether it's walking more quickly, uh, an exercise bike, um, other, you know, rowing machine, whatever, whatever works, more aerobic, and then a bit of weights. But that I think, you know, to, to, taper it to the individual that's where a pulmonary rehabilitation program is helpful thanks so stephanie wants to know is there a lower level of lung function at which uh, a nintan dip would be considered or withdrawn no so um so thankfully, whereas for there is this sort of contradictory, paradoxical situation where patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, who have an FVC less than 50% cannot have access to nintadenib. That same rule does not apply in the non-IPF patients, including scleroderma. So there isn't a level of function that we need to meet to prescribe nintadenib. Any lung function is okay. We would just be wishing to see progression. As I said, you have to show progression in lung function before we're able to prescribe nintadenib. And we don't, um, yes, that, that would be. Yeah. Um, so Elizabeth wants to know if there's any changes to the diet that could help with ILD. So, uh, so thank you for that question, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, there isn't there isn't a diet for IOD specifically. Uh, as I've said, the um, reflux is often a problem for patients with scleroderma. So, in that sense, uh, because we believe that uncontrolled reflux could make the lung fibrosis worse, yeah. uh, I would opt for a diet that works that minimizing the minimizes the reflux so that would be avoiding spicy foods um, avoiding lots of coffee acidy foods and avoiding eating three hours before bedtime but those are all uh, advice that's all advice for improving reflux symptoms for the ILD itself it's just a regular healthy diet one problem that some patients have is losing weight. And um, some patients with uh, severe fibrosis or very active disease or on nintadenib, because nintadenib can itself drop appetite and therefore cause weight loss. And those are patients that need dietitian review. Uh, and we're going to be starting a study shortly with our dietitian, uh, Raz, uh, looking at whether we can help with a dietary intervention patients who are losing weight and have lung fibrosis across the spectrum of IOD patients. That's quite an interesting study then. Yes, um, yes we're looking yeah. forward to, to, to doing it. 
Um, so Karen has asked, is it unusual for a lung fibrosis, which has been stable for more than 20 years to suddenly show a decline? Uh, yes, it is a bit unusual. It's not unheard of. Um, one has to always look at the decline. Is it just a marginal decline and nothing else has changed? Symptoms haven't changed. The CT hasn't changed. So I would want to know that that decline is real, is, uh, is confirmed with progression of disease on CT. Um, but scleroderma, as, I, as I've shown, can be quite unpredictable. It's unusual for it to be stable for 20 years and then progress, but it's not impossible. But I would want to know whether there's confirmation of that FVC worsening with CT findings, etc. Mm. Um, so is uh, nintabinib something that you can just discontinue? When can you discontinue that if you were taking it? So basically, uh, we, we tell patients that uh, if you don't tolerate nintadenib, there can be, um, so it's very important, for example, if you're taking nintadenib to always, always take it with food um, and to take, you know, a good meal in the morning and in the evening to tolerate the nintadenib. Some patients, however, just cannot tolerate it, have major diarrhea despite using anti-diarrhea tablets. So if you have diarrhea, we would recommend starting on Imodium. Um, and if despite that, uh, despite the dietary ad adjustments, one continues to not tolerate it, and especially if one is losing a lot of weight, you would discontinue and nothing happens if you discontinue nintadenib. So it's not like steroids that you need to discontinue very slowly. You can't stop nintadenib. And in fact, when patients are not tolerating nintadenib, we often suggest, okay, let's stop for two weeks or for however long it takes to um, improve the situation. And then maybe restart at a lower dose, like 100 milligrams twice a day. The, the treatment dose is 150 twice a day, but there is also a lower dose that can be tried. And sometimes patients tolerate that dose and can even then go back up to the full one. So I would recommend being in close contact with your specialist nurses um, and discussing that, uh, discussing the nintadenib, discontinuation of nintadenib, because there can be a number of options uh, to continue it. But if you stop it, nothing happens. Um, Paloma wants to know, could pregnancy worsen ILD? Uh, yes, uh, it could. Um, so pregnancy in, in, the, in across connective tissue disease is sometimes has been seen to worsen ILD. Of course, we have had patients with scleroderma who have had pregnancies uh, and it's, it's um, gone well, but advice on pregnancy would always be together with a specialist who is um, a specialist obstetrician and gynecologist specialized in higher risk pregnancies. Um, and you would want to know how severe the disease. So obviously the more severe the disease is at baseline, the greater the risk of the pregnancy. So we would always recommend that the patient be seen by a specialist with experience in high-risk pregnancy and immunosuppression during pregnancy, because of course, certain drugs are allowed, certain are not. Um, but yes, we have seen on occasions pregnancy being associated with worsening ILD. Um, so we've had a couple questions about reflux, um, mentioned that it can be a problem with systemic scleroderma. So how are they related? What are the symptoms and that kind of? How are they related, the symptoms of reflux with worsening? So we've, mm. uh, we've done a, a study um, that hasn't yet been published, but are supported by SIUK. And, they, uh, and the impression we had with the study was that uh, patients that had more severe reflux also measured by impedance. So that's you know, going with a little tube down the nose into the gullet and measuring the number of reflux episodes, uh, both acid and non-acid for 24 hours. 
and there was a trend for that being associated with worsening lung function over time. So um, one would, if, if you have uncontrolled reflux symptoms on good anti-reflux treatment, um, one would need to see a gastroenterologist, ideally with experience in scleroderma, uh, to advise on the best management of that. Mm. Um, so Kelly wants to know about what other treatment options are available if you are intolerant to nintabinib. So <laughs> at the moment, there isn't another antifibrotic agent that is available. Um, there is perfenidone. Um, so for example, for patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis uh, that cannot tolerate intadenib, they can go on perfenidone and vice versa because both are licensed for treatment for IPF. Um, we're waiting to hear about the results of the SLS3 trial, which was looking at the effects of perfenidone on top of mycophenolate, and hopefully those results will be published in the near future and may lead with time to the approval of perfenidone as well. The problem with perfenidone is that there have been, the trials so far, um, there's been one in unclassifiable IOD and one in progressive IOD overall called the RELIEF trial. And uh, the problem was that with that, that the RELIEF trial was stopped early. And so they, uh, there was less confidence, they had less patients, about half of what they were expecting, and there was less confidence in the results. However, um, even in the, because they had to uh, guess a lot of the, uh, estimate a lot of the lung function changes. Having said that, that trial was, did meet its primary outcome. So perfenidone, is associated, it does seem to be associated with a slowing down that is quite similar to nintadmib. But because these two trials did not meet their primary outcome, it has not been licensed for use in progressive pulmonary fibrosis despite management as nintadmib has. Mm. Um, yeah, so going back to the reflux, Celia wants to know what the symptoms are. So the symptoms are, can be varied. Um, uh, you can have, um, you know, the classic ones are heartburn. So a feeling of heartburn often after eating, um, burping, bloating, a feeling of, you know, your stomach being really full, um, having a feeling of food coming back up, also at night when you're lying down, uh, nausea, and sometimes reflex can be silent. So you, you can't, you don't have uh, major symptoms. Although most patients with scleroderma do have some symptoms of reflux. Um, are you able to take both uh, mycophenolate and nintabinib together? Yes. So the, the, the usefulness of the census trial was that half of the patients in the census trial, which was specifically targeted at scleroderma ILD patients, looking at nintadenib, so patients were on either nintadenib or placebo, but they were allowed to be on mycophenolate in the background. So it turned out that half of the patients in the census trial were on mycophenolate. And so there were a good number of patients that were on both mycophenolate and nintadenib, and no extra safety signals have come out. So it seems that it is safe to use both mycophenolate and nintadenib. With nintadenib, you have to look at lung liver function tests every month for six months and then every three months. With mycophenolate, you have to do the blood tests uh, as well. So, you know, you would be monitoring liver function with both. Mm. Um, so Melanie had asked, does uh, rituxagenib help slow progression? Sorry, asks what? Uh, does rixtabinab? Rituximab. Yeah, that one. It helps slow progression. So um, we, had, uh, we had looked at, um, we had done a retrospective study of rituximab in patients who were progressing despite intensive immunosuppression. So they were, these were patients that had had cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, and uh, and there were 
a number of patients where the decline was stopped with rituximab. Um, one of the issues with rituximab during the pandemic is that uh, rituximab, because it eliminates your B cells, which then um, reduces your defenses against infections, um, the rituximab does markedly reduce your defenses against COVID. So we have been a bit more cautious about using rituximab during the pandemic. Uh, but if it is felt to be needed, again, it's not licensed. So it would be on a sort of compassionate basis, single patient uh, approval. Uh, but we have used it on occasion. Hmm. Okay, so I think this will be the last question. I might need your help pronouncing this. Is tocilinab an antifibrotic? Tocilizumab, yes. No, tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6. And IL-6 is one of a key, is a key pro-inflammatory cytokine. So it is an anti-inflammatory rather than an antifibrotic, then it may downstream, because it's impacting on inflammation, it may also have some effects on fibrosis. But I think the tocilizumab trial suggests that its main um, action in preventing worsening is in dampening down inflammation that then does not lead to fibrosis. Mm. Just one more question, if you don't mind. Sure. Are sure. there any treatment options for gullet esophageal involvement to be considered for lung transplant? So that's a, that's a, a very good question. And um, the, I mean, in, in theory, there are surgical options. The problem with the surgical option is that often in scleroderma, you have achalasia. So that means that the esophagus is no longer moving, is no longer able to con contract and therefore move the food down into the stomach. And so the surgery, which is fundoplication, basically puts a stop to the lower esophageal sphincter, avoiding food going back up. But if the esophagus is not moving, then that doesn't work. So we, we tend to send any patient for um, evaluation of transplant to a gastroenterologist with experience also a scleroderma patient to assess whether a surgical option is possible. Often it is not possible because of this issue of mobility, but in some patients it may be possible. So it has to be decided uh, by the uh, gastroenterologist on an individual basis. Mm. Let's see. Well, um, I think we've reached the end of our time, so I think we'll leave it there. But thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Rizzoni, for your time. It has been very informative, and I feel like I've learned a lot. So I hope everyone else has too. Thank you, Annabelle. And thank you to everyone for contributing. They were all excellent questions, and I, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.